Hello, I'm so happy to be finally doing this video. I'm so sorry it's been so long. Um, all I can say is I've sort of started a new job and I've started a new routine and that's kind of taken over my life a little bit. So um, this has kind of gone in the back burner, but I'm so sorry and I'm happy to all of you who have been so patient and understanding about this. Anyway, um, yeah, I've been wanting to do this video as much as you guys have presumably been wanting to see it. Um, today is going to be partly, I'm going to start the way I usually do with these classes, showing you a few examples, um, because I said this class was going to be about virtual museums, and I'm going to talk about that a bit. What I didn't expect was so many of you choosing the virtual museum option in the final assignment, so I am going to be including your thoughts in this. Don't worry, like I said, I didn't put any names in it, but um, yeah, your thoughts kind of reflected what I would have said, so it's better to use your thoughts than mine in this. I thought it would be good. So yeah, let's get started. So first of all, I'm going to show you a few definitions, um, some official definitions I came across, and maybe once you read these and you hear other people's thoughts and maybe your own thoughts, you'll see that you've been incorporating what I've been talking about and that you basically understand virtual museums. Um, in the last few years, technological development has shown the capacity to radically change museum storytelling, especially when it comes to museums of history, science, and archaeology. <clears throat> so in museums specifically, the idea of storytelling is very important because you can do it in a lot of different ways. You don't even need words to tell a story. You can use objects, obviously, or you can use images or just you can go through a museum and you can look at things and not even realize that you've been told a story. But at the end, the text maybe or just your general feeling will make you feel like you've been involved with some kind of history or some kind of just general understanding. Virtual museums are defined as a collection of digitally recorded images, sound files, text documents, and other data of historical, scientific, or, or cultural interests that are accessed through electronic media. So something about this that I kind of want to draw your attention to is that virtual museums, there are many different definitions of virtual museums. You can have the one which I've kind of highlighted in the next point where you can navigate museum rooms where you can have close-up views of particular objects or exhibit panels or zooming in on objects close together. So these kind of virtual museums are just trying to make the physical space of a museum um, more accessible online or just trying to have a replica of what you might find in a museum. Other kinds of virtual museums um, and incorporations of the technology that I'm going to talk about are kind of like extensions of learning. So we're going to talk about virtual realities and things like that, where museums might try and recreate um, historical periods or try and recreate an experience. Um, museums try to do that in a lot of ways. You can kind of get it when you look at particular objects, but a cool thing about technology is that you can take it, take it one step further and almost exactly recreate what you might have it, experience in a specific period. Something I've seen before, um, I said before, but I'm from Canada and one exhibit I saw before was a recreation of a snowstorm. So I kind of got to experience a snowstorm somewhere where they wouldn't normally have snow. So that was kind of cool. Um, virtual museums of this type can be a powerful tool for comparative study and for research into a particular subject, material, or a locality. So these are things that were highlighted, and as you'll see when I get to your comments, these are things that were highlighted by you. Um, museums are good for research, and they're good to sort of remove the barrier of locality. So often museums... Um, you can only see an object if you're in a specific country or something like that. But if you look at it virtually, you can sort of, you don't need to be in that particular place to see an object or you don't need to have the experience of the country to understand it more, if 
that makes sense. Right now I'm going to show you a couple examples of virtual museums, which I hope will shape your understanding of them. Um, a couple of you mentioned Google Arts and Culture in your virtual museums essays, so um, I'm just going to show this for the people who haven't heard of it. Google Arts and Culture is really interesting because it lets you explore um, museums and art gallery collections through their specific um, through specific objects. You can look at, um, say, a painting, or you can also explore through um, through locality. So a specific country. This is really interesting too because it's kind of like what I was talking about in the National Museums lecture where um, museums like you to explore through countries, so kind of like you're exploring the world or something like that. It's really cool. Another thing you can do is explore through different movement or a theme or something like that. Um, something that you can do, which I don't think, unless you specifically try that, um, you can explore museums through color. So I don't know if you're a visual learner, so that would be for those who like to explore that way. Another thing that this Google Arts and Culture offers, which is not possible in a physical museum, is you can get up close to a specific aspect of an object. So yeah, this is just really cool. Different things that you can do in virtual museums. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the app for Google Arts and Culture, but you can take a picture of yourself on your smartphone and then that'll connect you to an object that looks like you. So this is another way of exploring objects that you might not have heard before. So yeah, this is just really fun things you can do. Google Arts and Culture is um, pretty well known in the museum industry right now, but yeah, it's really cool. This is another virtual museum project I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, this is a natural museum in Berlin. Um, this is a project that actually made use of Google Arts and Culture. So this was interesting since we just talked about that. An extinct world brought back to life. So this is really interesting too because virtual museums, as I've said, they can bring something that physical museums can't really do. They can make the bringing back of a history more real for visitors. So this project focuses specifically on dinosaurs. And something I wanna talk about here is that this project, it's incorporated many different aspects of technology. So as you can see, both iOS and Android can partake in this project and it's incorporated YouTube, Street View, and you can view 3,000 species on display. So these are things that a physical museum can't do. And something, the different aspects of technology, you might, one person might get something different from Street View than YouTube. So these are just different aspects of technology all coming together to explore something similar, which is dinosaurs. So yeah, this is really cool too. Um, I'm actually gonna go on the website they have here. So as you can see, because we've just looked at the Google Arts and Culture website, if you have a familiarity with Google Arts and Culture, you can understand how to navigate yourself around this project. You can look at different types of animals, that kind of thing, the evolution of birds. So that's a theme. Another thing I want to highlight is that this project, it's, it's a collaboration between the Natural History Museum the American Museum of Natural History and the Mer Berlin Natural Museum. So again, um, oh, and 64 more connections. So again, we're seeing connections between museums, we're seeing collaborations. So this is another thing that virtual museums can do. So yeah, this is really fascinating. And I'll leave these links when I post this, I'll leave these links down below. So yeah, this is really cool too. Another understanding of a museum I wanted to bring your attention to was the Hern Herneman Museum, um, which is a museum that you can find on Snapchat of all places. Um, I've used it, you sort of, you walk through a door and then you see this big object and you see little display cases around. Um, it's kind of cool because it takes your understanding of everybody. This is what 
most people would expect to see in a museum. So when you walk through this door, you're not surprised by what you see. And then it's just sort of, yeah, it's another fun way to explore history and to, you know, to promote the use of museums. Another thing I want to talk about with Snapchat is Snapchat is a great way when you're actually in a physical museum to share your experience in a museum. Um, things like that, Snapchat, Instagram, museums really like when you use those um, those programs to promote their um, collections. It's just really cool little things you might have not even thought about, um, reflections of the 21st century, things like that. Just Yeah, I just find it really cool and yeah, things that are incorporated in your everyday life you can use to help museums. So now I actually want to get into your thoughts. Um, these were written, some of them, a month ago. So I find it really interesting that some of your thoughts reflect what I would have talked about and just the general understanding of virtual museums. So yeah, just really good job, you guys, on these thoughts. And I'm really excited for other students to hear your thoughts. Um, like I've said, I didn't put any names in this, but yeah. Many researchers worldwide have had their work grinded to a halt due, the, due to the inability to access certain collections and specimens due to current circumstances. As there is a drive to progress research and the problems with grand validity arise, it has put many individuals in a state of unease. Thus, with the impl implementation of virtual collections in certain museums, some research can still continue. Um, this kind of highlights um, a definition I brought about earlier, which talks about virtual museums helping with research. Another thing I want to talk about um, is validity of collections. This is something that can be strange in virtual museums because you can see something virtually and not believe it. I think museums, they have the ability when you see an object, you believe it's there, but virtual museums, something different is there. Um, and yeah, um, the current state of the world, museums are being changed dramatically because of COVID-19. And a lot of you actually mentioned COVID-19 in your thoughts. Um, unfortunately, that's this is something that has affected the world. I know museums are the least of everybody's worries, but still it's changed the sphere and it's changed many things. And researchers are trying to find ways to remedy this and a lot of you brought about um, ways that this can be helped by museums so I thought this was really cool. Even though creating a virtual museum takes so much patience and energy, the result of these hard works are really worth it in order to make a place on the internet where people can visit the collection. On the website, the museum can also put all of the information they might not be able to deliver to the audience in the traditional way of visiting a museum. So I think this is really cool for a lot of different ways. Sometimes we'll, museums will have um, little QR codes where you can connect your phone and you can get more information at the moment, or they'll give you little machines where you can listen to more information if you want to. Um, I really like that idea because you can get information at your own pace and not be forced, so to speak, to listen to more information. Another thing that what's cool about putting information online is that you can explore it at your own pace and because more than one of you had talked about the daunting nature of museums and how it can be overwhelming so reading information when you have the desire to learn in a space that is comfort comfortable for you is a really interesting thought too the importance of digitizing museum collections is extreme as it allows for a greater sharing of the pieces, information and their knowledge. In this way, researchers, students and curious people from all over the world can have access to the museum's collection to meet their purposes, whether academic, school or personal research, not being restricted to a local audience, but spreading out so there are no borders between these pieces and the message they can pass and the people who are willing to listen to those messages. So this is really interesting because it highlights the different type of people that would want to learn. Um, you don't need to be a researcher to want to access information. You can be casually interested or you can just be curious. And I think 
there are people who are willing to listen to all the messages and there are people who just want to take what they can from an exhibit or from collections. So this is really cool too. It just highlights the different type of motivation that people have for wanting to learn and for exploring collections. Another effective application of modern technologies, as mentioned before, would be reconstructions and small videos of how things might have been built and how people may have lived. It is often easier to see what something might have been like rather than trying to imagine it. A combination of audiovisual, audiovisual applications and text with accurate descriptions, which the reader can each take their time with, should make for an entertaining and instructional day at the museum. So this was something I was talking about before where you kind of echoed what I was ringing about earlier. Um, the idea of reconstructing um, how things might have been built or how they might have lived can be explored through virtual realities and better in virtual museums, I would say. Um, you can do a lot of imagining in museums, but often virtual museums can maintain a sense of accuracy, especially when you're talking about um, a very specific period of time. I've seen that with like First Nations villages or something like that. They tried to virtually create it so you can have an accurate understanding of what that might have looked like. Um, in these comments, I kind of brought about things that you said that could be better in museums. So this is where I'm going to get to your constructive thoughts on where museums can do better and the problems that might come in museums. While there is undoubtedly value in online collections, there are also issues related to copyright laws that can pose problems. Um, Issues faced by museums whose collections remain within the protection of copyright law, typically those works that have been created within the last 95 years. Because of these issues, many online collections, including those of the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, only contain objects and artworks that are currently within the public domain. It is important to remember that however useful digital collections may be, there are restrictions associated with producing them. Um, I think this is really interesting, too, because it sort of highlights that there are a lot of things that could be explored in museums, but they don't have the right to um, to talk about them or to explore them. Um, this person focused specifically on photos, but sometimes you don't have the right to reproduce or recreate um, or even explain as a authority figure because museums are an authority figure, um, like certain aspects of history of certain mythologies that just isn't available for some histories and some photos. Um, yeah, it's really important that you maintain within the public domain. So yeah, I really appreciate this comment. I think it's really important. In a museum, its objects are not mainly accessible for research as they are displayed behind a glass case and often cannot be viewed from all sides or handled. Therefore, archives of museums have inherently different functions with museums trying to establish a more or less objective narrative and linear view of history in order to allow an easier access to the complex network of information that history actually is. So this comment brings about two things. First of all, the difference between archives and museums, it sort of brings back um, an earlier lecture where I spoke about how museums, they have a specific story to tell and they need to m make sure everything's at a general learning um, understanding. Um, archives, they can be more specific and they can be more open to a specific research or something like that. And objects are not mainly accessible for research as they are displayed. This is another idea. A lot of you brought about the problems that museums, they can't display everything and that um, you're often looking at objects through 
the glass so you're not seeing naturally objects. This is something that's really important too, and I'm glad you guys picked up on that. The interpretation of objects is always done in a different manner by different people on the basis of their skills, knowledge, and background because authenticity of Indian history also suffers due to different backgrounds of authors and their outlook in writing history affected by their background. Um, this kind of idea was highlighted by many of you, um, people of different education backgrounds and people, um, especially people with archaeology or anthropology backgrounds, they can get something different from museums than a local person might or um, something like that. I think it's really important that museums, they both accommodate to people who would have specific knowledge and to people who have general knowledge and they're just looking to learn. So yeah, that's really interesting too. And I'm really glad this was brought up too. Overall, I think it's very important for all museums to, to document every and any artifact or have a record of their collections digitally. For people who work in museums, it may be difficult to have everything copied or go through the digitization for every object. However, for people who are unable to visit the museums and need to conduct their research, these visualizations are able to help them from their house during our current pandemic. Um, this is really interesting because it brings about the problem of um, so many objects in a collection and obviously that responsibility goes on museum workers um but when you put in the effort to document every artifact then obviously it would be appreciated by the general public um i really like that this brings about um the two perceptions the perception of the museum worker who would have to go through every object and the value that this has to the general public who would be viewing these digitally. Utilizing social media these days makes a great difference when it comes to interacting more closely with the community. People have the opportunity to read about certain exhibits before paying a visit to the actual museum. Like this, they may have been less overwhelmed by the sheer number of showcase objects and might be able to concentrate more on and understand better the exhibit they came to see. When I read this, I was reminded of my lecture on mental health in museums. I think something to think about is that you can go to a museum to learn, but when you go there, there can be so much to learn that you can be overwhelmed. And I think this is a really important point. I really think when you go into a museum, you should be able to be comforted by the fact that you can take your knowledge home and that you can learn more at home. So this is a really great idea too. Um, and this was something I wrote because it seemed like you guys all came with a definition of museums. So this was a concluding thought I came up with with museums about where they're going in the future. Museums are constantly trying to adapt with society while also truthfully highlighting the past. The way information is presented and how you experience museums will change, but their intention will always be the same, to connect people and share knowledge. Um, when I talked about this, I was sort of thinking about how museums are trying to adapt with society, so that would be the different movements and the different kinds of virtual um or in technological aids that can help them in presenting the history. The past is always going to be the same. The past, there's obviously going to be more of the past, but once you go far back, the past is going to be the same. So you have to highlight it the same way. Um, but the thing that will change is the way you can present the past or the way you can sort of um, deal with the past, I would say. Um, so yeah. Um, as this is the last class, I really wanted to thank you all. Um, I hope you guys got as much out of this class as I did. Um, I wasn't thinking about putting your thoughts in the last lecture, but I was really blown away by the sheer number of people who actually did a, a final assignment and the really insightful thoughts you guys had. So yeah, thank you so much. And, um, Thank you to you guys too who have been following me on Instagram and being supportive. You can connect with me 
more there if you're still interested in learning more about museums. Um, I learned a lot too in this class. I learned how to present museums and just, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for being patient with this last lecture. Bye.